We have an interesting topic this morning, one that we have probably been a debate, law and grace. And sometimes we think, well, that's just privy to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Not true, um, since I didn't come out of the Adventist Church uh, and so forth. But this has been an issue uh, for years. Today, we're not really going to debate that subject, but what we are going to talk about is, in essence, the law as an educational piece. So before we start, why don't we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Certainly need God's guidance as we do our things today, so let's bow our heads. Our Father who art in heaven, what a joy it is and what a privilege it is that because we are in you, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, words cannot express how thankful we are that you allow us to do that very thing. And today as we talk about your law, and uh, try to understand its purpose for us as Christians, that uh, we might understand the gospel in verity, and that we, in essence, will be able to follow and uh, to be good examples of your cause. And so we ask your presence with us today. We ask for the Holy Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, if you take a look at the slide there, these are all Old Testament texts that some people think that are usually only in the New Testament. And number one is that Ecclesiastes 12, 13, now all has been heard, here's the conclusion of the matter, fear God and keep his commandments. Okay? Well, Mark, good to see you. Number two, love the Lord your God with all your heart, serve him only. Number three, and taken from Leviticus, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. Now, my first question to you is, before we get into the nuts and bolts of this thing, would you say that's a good compilation of a definition of law? Would you say those are the basic components to law keeping? How's that? That's, a, that's not a multiple question. You can just say yes or no or whatever, but what do you think? So I'm going to ask you today is we're going to have one question. One question. What is the purpose of the law? Now, what is the purpose of the law? Okay, you know, um, when we talk about law, we, some people bring up the Torah, and Torah sometimes to some represents the first five books of the, the Old Testament, and, but it also means it's a compilation of laws. And as we go to the first five books, what do we find in law? There are many kinds of laws, isn't that true? So, I mean, uh, you know, they talked about you know, the ark. What was put into the ark, you remember? The ark of the covenant, what was put in there? Manna? Pardon? Ten commandments. Ten commandments. The moral law, as it's called, right? And anything else? Now, I was saying, why would that be in there? Aaron's budded rod is in there, okay? And so forth. So, what does that tell you about the moral law of its significance? It was put in the Ark of the Covenant. Doesn't that have a higher standard than all other laws? It is the Moral law that we're going to talk about today. Yes, ma'am. That is correct. In fact, some people think what law was set outside, well, let's put it this way. What book was set outside of the ark? Most scholars believe this, but let's see what you think. Pardon? No, not Leviticus. There was. But the, the one thing, that there was one book out of the five, okay, that not only was set outside the ark, but was used by the kings of Judea and Israel whenever a new king came upon. And what would they do? They'd call all the people together, the priests, the scribes, the common people, and they would read the book of Deuteronomy. It is really encompasses with the exception of all the stories of Jacob and everything, all the laws that you'll find in the first five books of the Old Testament. Okay? So today what we're going to concentrate on is moral law. Now, uh, I do not come from an Adventist background. How many do not come from an Adventist background? 
<sighs> so we have about four or five heathen among us, right? Uh, and so forth. So what does that mean? Well, I know when I first became an Adventist, I was enthused with the things that I saw. And what enthused me uh, was the fact of the Sabbath, the state of the dead. All those things I, were, were unbelievable to me. And prophecy. The church Carol and I went to, my wife was called the Evangelical United Brethren Church, no longer exists. They were part of an acquisition, usually he's not in a commercial perspective, but of the Methodist Church. And so, oh, you're nodding your head, are you aware of that? Oh my goodness, okay. What's a church that's comparable to them is probably the Nazarene church, if you've ever attended that church. But they had a very good understanding of the law and faith. I didn't know it that well, because I only attended because my wife, I was dating my wife, and it was either go to church or we weren't dating. So the options were few, and uh, I think I made the right choice. So anyway, today we're going to talk about the purpose of the law. And so let's begin, if we will. Uh, we might want to just get a few comments again, what you think the purpose of the law is. And then we're going to take five basic guidelines we're going to walk through. So anybody want to volunteer that? What do you think? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Uh, Oh, okay, good. Let me turn these things up a little bit. There we go. Revealing the character of God. Oh, I'd like to start right there. Thank you very much. You must have been reading my notes. Uh, and so forth. Because revealing the character of God. Does the law reveal God's character? Does it really? All right. Let's take a Bible text. I want you to use your Bibles today with me, if you will. And I want you to go to Romans 7.12. So if you'll do that... Uh, Romans 7, 12, take your Bible, let's take a look at this. And we'll also include verse 14 in that, and here's what it says. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy. It is righteous and good. We know that the law is spiritual, Paul says, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So what gives us the impression that the law, and he's talking about the moral law here, kind of represents or reflects God's character. What description there gives you that idea? Paul said he's not spiritual, right? What was he really saying? I am not spiritual. I am unspiritual. Yes. Okay. So read, when people we read the Lord is holy. Okay. What what do we mean when we say that God is holy? Okay. Okay. That's a good definition, right? I think. When are you? God is a God of the Bible. Says God is what? Love. And as we go through this episode or walking through these things about the law, we notice up here that God bases law on love. And that's the key. And we're going to talk about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Are they the one and the same or are they different? Key. Okay. So let's go back to God's character. We're going to try to run something. I got some slides here I want to go through. I want to get through it. So do we all agree that the law is a reflection of God because it's holy, it is spiritual, it is righteous. Who is righteous? God is righteous. You and I are not. And so forth, despite the Pharisees. We are not righteous people. We are unspiritual people. Okay? Now, very quickly, and this is, I'll, I'll throw this in, but I'm going to have to move along with this. What makes us unspiritual? Okay, sin. Now, how in the world did sin become part of our makeup? Bob? We are born that way. Oh. You have to sin to be a sinner. Okay. Now, we talk about God being a just God. You know, when you talk about the gospel, we talk about God's love, and rightfully so. 
But is the gospel also just? That if Jesus had not come, that would have been an unjust act. You ever heard that before? Let's think about that. Because of Adam's sin, sin spread to who? All men. This is worse than the COVID virus. There is, but there is a vaccine. <laughs> Isn't that right? We have a vaccine for this. But it spread to all men. What say did you have in that? You had none. I've given many Bible studies, and maybe you have. And one of the questions that comes from non-Christians, the gospel is not fair. How can God punish me for sin I had no control of? And the Bible even goes to say that I can't do anything about it in the flesh. Is he right? He is right. So Jesus came because he loved us, but he also became because he knew it was the just thing to do. Have you ever thought about that? It was the right thing to do, but he's God, he didn't have to. Why go through all of that? It's not worth the trouble. Because he loved us. And because he loved us, God is also a God of justice. The only difference between the two, excuse me, the only difference between the two is this. You automatically get Adam's gift of sin, which we call original sin. But when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, re righteousness passed on to all men, but there is one little difference between the two. What is it? All men declared righteous because of Christ's death. You have to accept it. That's the difference. God wants you to accept his righteous because you want to. He wants you to accept his invitation because you want to. You see value. Okay, any disagreement there? Okay, so we have a little idea of, of law and so forth. We know that it's a reflection of God's character and just based on what we just talked about earlier when some of you were not here, that law in essence is comprised of the written law or the letter of the law plus the spirit of the law. You need both. So let's look at a few texts if we can and we want to talk about that the written law, or I should say the letter of the law, Paul talks about a lot, and the spirit of the law. Matthew 5, which is 20 through 22, if you want to read that. Matthew 5, 20 through 23, also 27 and 28. Lisa has a mic there, so she can, if there are any questions you have, she can basically uh, provide a mic. Here's what it says. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? Okay. We'll come back to that in a second. You have, had, sir, have said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. That's what the Pharisees taught. That's what they felt the law taught. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother or his sister will be subject to judgment. I wonder how many of us are guilty of murder based upon Jesus' definition. Now, I know if you turn on the radio and the news today, it's just a loving message, isn't it? Isn't it just how nice and how kind people are to one another? And you said, what network are you on? And so forth. There is no network like that. And so forth. Do you feel in your own mind that we live in a generation today of hate? Despite if we don't agree with somebody, we basically go after their character. We find anything we can, uncover anything we can, look in every closet to see if we can get something on them because we don't like the way they think. Am I right or am I wrong? And what happens when you and I listen to that every day? What happens? And we can all probably say, and I am included, I've had to turn the nose off because it's affecting my disposition. Let's kill that. <laughs> oh, she's right there. <laughs> she just said amen. <laughs> it affects us, doesn't it? By beholding, we become changed. We live in a world of hate. And it's from all sides. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green Party, 
Whatever you are and whatever we are, there is no place in the Christian's life for that kind of attitude. Is that correct? Okay. But it's easy to participate in it. And that's what we want to talk about a little bit today because that's the principle that's affecting us now. It's not just the COVID-19 virus, right? Our issues and our problems are with the hate that's in our world today. It's all right to have a passion for right. We all have that, right? But when we attack people and not the issue, that's my issue. That's what I've got to deal with, and so do you. So the law is good, it's righteous, it's healthy. Paul says there's nothing bad about the law. And then Jesus comes along and says, let me redefine that. The Pharisees felt, now very quickly in the background of the Pharisees, when Jesus came to this world, there were approximately 6,000 Pharisees, and that comes from Robert Coleman's book, the, uh, what was the name of that book? Yeah. Um, uh, the Path of Righteous, uh, the Pharisees' Path to Righteousness. That was the name of the book by John Coleman back in the 1960s. In fact, uh, we had a couple of authors that kind of plagiarized some of that book and used it. They were Adventist writers, George Knight being one. The Pharisees, from the Bible perspective, what, what does the Bible kind of, what does it kind of give you the feeling about the Pharisees? How does the Bible kind of project that, if you could say that in a sentence? Favorable? Unfavorable? No comment? What do you think, Robert? Unfavorable. But let me tell you something. The Pharisees came about during the time of the Maccabeans. And here's why they formulated. They looked back at the history of their nation, Israel and Judea and so forth, and all the disobedience and the culture that came into them, and they saw the punishment that they received. They said, you know what? We've got to set up some laws within the law so that they don't actually break the law. Their intentions were good. And they looked at the law as an essence, uh, and some people say, well, the Pharisees believed in perfection. No, they did not. They knew that they could not keep the law. So their philosophy was this. At the end of your life, they would add up, I have 9,847 points of good behavior. And I have 8,205 and I'm in the right side of the ship. That's how they looked at it. And so law came to them, they basically follow what we call the letter of the law. Letter of the law means we follow as it is written, okay, and so forth. So the law as an educational piece, as an educational piece did demonstrate God's righteousness. But if you just took the letter of the law, it leaves something out. Now, I'm jumping ahead, but let's just see where we can come from, just where we're at. The letter of the law leaves something out. What does it leave out? Love. There was a, oh, I'm trying to think of the theologian, one of the, most, one of the famous ones of the 20th century. I'll think of it in a minute. He said, a Christian who lives a life as thou shall not is a life that will fail. Agree with that? Yes. Dan? One problem with that is the translation. Okay. We, we translate it as thou shalt not, which sounds like a strong command, but there's only two that are written in the imperative. If it was translated correctly, it would be like you know not. The only two that are in the imperative is remember and honor. Yeah. And I think that's proper and that's a c correct. If you read most modern translations, it incorporates what you just said. Isn't that right? It's a little more proactive. But if the law to us is more of a prohibition on out activity of what we do and don't do, we're missing the point. And that's why Jesus came to say, now wait a minute. It's been said that you shall not commit adultery, but if you look at a woman in lust, you've already committed her and nine left the room. Jesus made it tougher, not easier. What he was trying to say, we say, well, law is a transgression of the law. Sin is a transgression of the law. Anything done without faith is sin. Anything that's not in accordance with God's will is sin. It's greater than that. It is a misunderstanding of how bad sin is and how deep it's ingrained in us. 
when we don't have a tra- proper understanding of what sin is, it leads us to, as Christians, as trying to do what we can, like the Pharisees, in order that God will look at us, and he'll look at him and say, well, it looks like you, uh, you're kind of ahead eight to four, and it's the ninth inning. And so, on one occasion, it says an expert stood up to test Jesus. And he said, teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Now, you know the story, so you, you kind of have a, already the answer. But what would, if you didn't know that story, how would you have answered that question? How did the rich young ruler answer that question? Well, I've kept the commandments from since I was young. And we'll come back to that story. And Jesus didn't disagree with him. He just didn't respond in that perspective. He kind of got on his level. Yeah, you, what he was really saying, yeah, you have made an F external effort to have good behavior. So he says, the love part of the law, sell everything you have and join me. He was asking him to become one of the disciples. He didn't just ask him to become a follower. He was asking him to become one of the disciples. It was almost the same invitation he gave Paul. And it said he dropped his head and walked away. Why? Because he did knew nothing about the spirit of the law. That is our danger today. The law is an education piece. This is, there's an old saying, and Billy Graham made this statement, and I didn't understand it then, but it's a great statement now. He said the way we follow the law is sometimes unlawful. An unlawful approach to law. It is dangerous, and ultimately you will either leave God's presence or will become hard and judgmental and the type of people, people look at Christians and say, well, yeah, he goes to church on Sabbath, but he's nasty. George Knight once said, he said, I've met some of the nas- nastiest vegetarians I've ever seen, some of the nastiest people. That doesn't mean vegetarians are nasty. What he was saying is, it can be Sabbath, it can be state of the dead. It makes it if you don't have God's love, it's not self-production here we're talking about. The law becomes brittle, it becomes hard, and I will tell you that, if we stay with it long enough, we will crucify the Savior just like the Jewish nation did. Isn't that right? The Romans didn't do that. They killed it. Do you think Pilate would have sent him to the cross if it had not been for the religious rulers? What do you think? No. We have had this in class before. Did you know that in the early church they had a day in celebration of Pilate? Did you know that? They looked at him different back then than we look at him today. They looked at Pilate and said, wow. Here's a heathen guy, you know, he has no, no religious backing, no nothing. Jesus had the longest conversations with Pilate. What is truth? Then he didn't give him time to answer. He would have answered that question, don't you think? But he stood up when everybody else sat down. Isn't that not true? So we give him credit, at least for that. Now, commandment keeping. Jesus says there's a qualifier to obeying his commandments. Obedience is critical in the Christian life, but how we exercise that is the key. Jesus said there's a condition to obedience. How many of you think there's a condition to obedience? There is a condition to obedience. Okay. Pardon? Pardon? Okay, uh, that's pretty good. You know, pastor gave a sermon. Isn't that right, George? He talked about faith, which is a lot of different terms we can use, but he used the primary one as trusting God. That's about as close as you can get, I think, uh, and so forth, trusting God. Okay, Jesus said, if you love me, then what did he say? Now, let me rephrase that. If you have no love in your heart, if you have not received my love, don't try obeying the commandments. Is that what he's really saying? That is what he's saying. So that means there needs to be a step before obedience. We'll talk about that later. All right, let's go on. So, point number one, the law is a reflection of God's character, and it explains why. Number two, it stands as a standard of judgment. The law is a standard of judgment of what the ideal human character is like. 
So, you agree with that? The law basically is used as how the human should be. If we go back to creation, it says that we were created in whose image? God's image. And so certainly, if we look at the first Adam, was he a righteous man? Yes, he was. No sin. His desire was to serve God. And there's something he had, didn't have, that we have. That's why Christ had to come as a second Adam. What is it that we have that Adam didn't have? Now, you say sin, but there's something more than that. We have a bent. We have a carnal nature he did not. That's what surprises us about sin, isn't it? How is it possible? We can understand why our children sometimes do the things you do. We can even understand sometimes the things we do. We have a premonition, or I should say a, a push into doing what the opposite of what God wants. It's a natural thing. We all have it, you know, and some say, well, after you uh, converted, it goes away. That's what I thought. About 15 minutes later, something's wrong. Because that isn't the way it worked, right? Paul's counsel to Timothy, and First Timothy is this, fight the good battle of faith. The Christian life is a constant battle. Would you agree with that? It's our nature against God's Holy Spirit, and it is a battle that will go on till the end. Fortunately, God gives us his Holy Spirit, right? And so forth. So it is a standard of judgment for us. Um, you remember the story or the parable of the goats and the sheep, don't you? And Jesus talks about the sheep, and what did he say about the sheep? Well, when I was hungry, you, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me, and he goes on down the list, and so forth, and he welcomes them into his kingdom. What part of the law was he talking about? The letter of the law or the spirit of the law? He was talking about the spirit of the law. Now, if we go a little deeper, they say, oh, we don't remember any of that. Now, we think he, they were thinking that they hadn't done it to Jesus directly. Oh, it goes further than that. I want you to think about that. They didn't remember the good deeds they did to anybody. They weren't counting to see how many times, you know, that they gave food to the next door neighbor. It became natural for them. You know, Moses Benden, in a couple of his books, made reference to the fact, and I think it's very good, that as we continue to walk with Christ, as we continue to mature, and some of us are slower than others, that we'll become more and more natural for us to do God's will. So natural that we won't realize that we're doing it. Isn't that amazing? And so forth. So, God says, you know, love is critical. To live by the written law by itself is tragedy. It is a life that will gain us nothing. When I was... Uh, my wife and I were um, babysitting a couple out in Watertown, Wisconsin, many, many years ago. And there were two little boys that she was babysitting. One was about nine or ten. The other one was maybe five or six. Their mother, uh, they didn't have a father. He would either left them. There had been a divorce, whatever. She was trying to work to support those two boys. And the little boy had no security. I mean none. I don't blame his mother. She had to work. She had to provide a living for those kids. And so who do you think he depended on? His older brother. But sometimes his older brother did, but sometimes we do as kids. He would hide from him. And do you know what that little boy would do? He'd almost go into convulsions. He was so scared. He had no safety. I mean, it was heart-wrenching to watch this poor little boy. He would cry. He would, I mean, I, I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. He had no security, had no someone to depend on. 
That's the way we are if we stay in the issue of with regard to the written law. We'll never show sure where we're at. We're never show sure what our relationship is. We're always looking back to see how good we are. And don't get me wrong, conduct is important because that's what people see. And God is concerned about conduct, but he said to the Pharisees, I want you to clean something. He said, you guys look pretty good on the outside, but what did he say about the inside? You got a problem. You know, you may have never had an adulterous affair, but you've thought about it a lot. That's what he's saying. And what he was really trying to say is, you know, I can help you with that inner problem. That's where I come in. The externals will take care of themselves. You agree with that? Externals take care of themselves. I want to be motivated. Remember that basically when we talk about the spirit of the law, we're talking about a process of thought, of attitude. What's our attitude in living the Christian life? Okay. Let's go on. Point number three. The law points out and contem condemns sin in the human heart. True or false? The law condemns sin and those who participate in it. Is that true? It's true. You know, that we've mentioned the text that involves sin. But there's another one here. And let's see if I want to use it. I'll have to push some of these away. Paul says, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sights by the work of the law. Rather the law makes us conscious of what sin is. So what's God, the law's purpose in this situation? It tells us what sin is, right? But what's the problem with the law? It says, you know what? You've been a bad boy or a bad girl. And, uh, and, and what's going to happen to you is death. And it's not going to be for a short term. And the law drops it. Doesn't it? So Paul uses kind of a metaphor. He says, you know, the law is kind of like a mirror. Do you remember that story in the Bible? And uh, let's uh, see if we can put the, might as well use these slides. I mean, uh, here we go. Uh, I, I, I missed this, so I'm going to intervene on myself and back up just a little bit because we I seem to think sometimes that other Christians and other denominations think the moral law is not, not good. Let me read you some few, few things very quickly. Most Christians, Protestants, and Catholics treat the Ten Commandments as the foundation of morality. In your discussions with other Christians other than Adventists, isn't that pretty much true? They don't hate the Ten Commandments. They think they're good things. Let's go on. Christians today tend to regard the commandments as binding on all of humanity. For many of them, all the commandments, even the obviously religious ones, are expected to serve as the basis for civil and moral laws. And I think we see that today. Remember the judge in Alabama had the Ten Commandments behind his chair? Remember that? And they were suing to have it taken down for the state to remove it. And he sued the state. Why? He says, because the Ten Commandments are viable as a tool for good morality and for justice. Let's go on. Um, there we go. Methodist. The moral law contained in the Ten Commandments, according to the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, was instituted from the beginning of the world and is written on the hearts of all People, you know, Ellen White was criticized because she stated, well, the law has been in effect from the beginning. Not at Mount, just at Mount Sinai. Where did she get that? Well, I'm telling you something. There were many, many people that believed that long before she ever wrote, John Calvin being one of them. And so anyway, he says this, Wesley held that the moral law, which is Canaan's Canada, stands today. It is in effect today. Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind in all ages has not depended either on time or place nor any other circumstance liable to change, but on the nature of God and the nature of man and their unchangeable relation to each other. Wesley Sermons, Volume 23. Okay, and, uh, and basically from the Methodist Handbook, here's what it says. In keeping with Wesleyan Covenant theology, and Ellen White was a, a much, I wouldn't say to say a follower, but she loved John Wesley. 
she came out of what church? The Methodist church, right? So why wouldn't she? But he had good theology and so forth. She says, so he says here, in keeping with Wesleyan theology, while the ceremonial law was abolished, we agree with that, right? Okay. While the ceremonial law was abolished in Christ and the whole mosaic dispensation itself was concluded upon the appearance of Christ, the moral law remains a vital component of the covenant of grace, having Christ as its perfecting end. As such, in Methodism, an important aspect of the pursuit of sanctification is the careful following of what? The Ten Commandments. So that's good theology, I think, and so forth. So let's take a look at this. This is from what is the meaning of the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And it comes from an article called Restored Church of God. And here's what it says. In Matthew 5, 20 through 44, we already covered that. Christ showed that obeying the letter of the law is a matter of physical action. Whereas obeying the spirit of the law requires more than just outward actions. It also involves an attitude of the mind. Referred to by the apostle Paul as the circumcision of the heart. Another example is in the keeping of the Sabbath day. To merely remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, is in obedience to the letter of the law. But to also rejoice in the Sabbath and call it a delight is keeping what? The spirit of the law. I can tell you, when we first became Adventists, I tell you, Sabbath was nasty. Terrible. And I was the reason. <laughs> That's the worst part. You know, we wanted to do the right thing. And you know, with new believers, we want to try to help them through all this, right? They don't want to go through what we went through, and so forth. Well, what, what was we doing on the Sabbath? Well, so first of all, we didn't let the kids go out and play. No, nope, that's rule number one. Number two, we would read the Bible. That's not a bad idea, but, and so forth. Number three, the preparation, and so forth. There was anything, I mean, to the latest T, is that had to be done before. And so, and it got to the point, the kids hated Sabbath. They, they dreaded it coming, and between you and me, I didn't say it. I, didn't, I was hoping it wouldn't come either. <laughs> what kind of an example was that to those who are attracted by Christ, and he tells us to remember the Sabbath, and they see that example? You tell me. I, uh, Kill and I one time were sitting in a, Seventh-day Adventist church, and they had what they call testimony countdown. Anybody remember that? I showed you how old we're getting. You know, we can't. Yes. I mentioned I was in here the other day, and some baby has some kind of drink uh, and so forth. But uh, in essence, they were having a testimony countdown, 10 volumes to those testimonies and so forth. And those testimonies you've got to be careful with because they are about individual people's lives. They don't all, those counsel does not always supply universally. Well, anyway, we got in there. We were new Christians. We, we had just been baptized, Leo, and we're sitting in there. The pastor's up there, and all of a sudden, they got on the ideal of chocolate. We spent 45 minutes debating whether we had, should have chocolate or not. I looked at my wife and said, who are these people? Would you have said the same thing? Uh, do we not have bigger fish to fry? I think so, and so forth. So the moral law gives us an idea, not only what God is like, not only that it is a standard of judgment. And I will say this, our entrance to heaven has got to be perfect. We do not get into heaven without perfect righteousness. That is law, and that is true. But there's good news about that, and we'll get to that in a minute. So it is a standard for judgment. All right. Point number four. The law points us beyond itself and human sinfulness. The law points us beyond. Anybody want to comment on that? Do you agree with that? How does the law point us beyond? Yeah, Mark. All right, it points us to the cross. Okay, it points us to the cross, and so forth. The law is good, it's a great thing. 
but it's made for the righteous, not for the sinful. So the Ba's purpose is for us to see that we need help. We cannot do this alone. And that's the counsel we should hear from the pulpit every, every sermon. We can't do this alone. We need help. And then the encouragement of the brethren as well. And so forth. Okay. And so, Paul says in Galatians 2, 19 through 21, he says this. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. That is a powerful statement. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. When we come to Christ, what, is, what happens when you and I accept his invitation by faith? Now, we may be new believers. We don't know anything about the Bible. But we know enough to know that we're out of step. Isn't that true? Romans 2 gives this idea. You don't need the Bible just by looking around at the heavens. There's a certain amount of faith that God has given us and knowledge that we know that we're missing something. Right? And so we come to Christ. What does Christ offer us? Yes. Okay, a life from death. Free from death, right? What causes the death? Sin, which is defined by the law. The law cannot help me. That's why Paul calls the law cursed. Not because it's bad, because it can't help him. Going back to the mirror. I go to the mirror and I see my hair is not combed. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And I see that I haven't shaved. Okay. It's, it's telling me that, right? So I take the mirror. And I say I got some egg on my face from breakfast this morning. So I take the mirror and try to get it off. Is that what the mirror is for? What do we use? A washcloth, a sponge, whatever. Jesus is our washcloth. And so in order to get rid of our sin, we use Jesus to take it away. John 3, 16, pretty basic on that, isn't it? Everybody knows that text. Well, not saved by works, but by grace. So what happens when, okay, we accept Jesus. He says he'll forgive our sins, and he won't remember them. He throws them to the bottom of the what? The sea, right? And then in John chapter 1, verse 12, and for those who received him, even to those who accept his name, he gives them the right to be what? Children of God. When you accept him, I don't care what you attitude is or what your character has been God says by faith if you accept my invitation now you say gee that doesn't seem fair because he's given all this but sin wasn't fair either when it was given by Adam was it Jesus isn't talking about fairness from that perspective he's saying look you need my righteousness and so we become every is everybody in this world a child of God the answer is no, they are not. We, in essence, are only children of God when we accept the invitation. That's what John tells us. And then when Peter was on the mount, I should say, well, maybe it was a little bit hilly there, during Pentecost, and he was telling the people about what the Jewish nation had done to the Savior. They had actually killed him. And they said, and you can just see it, what do we do? And he said, repent now, what is repentance? I used to have, if you cry 20 minutes, it qualifies. That's not repentance. Repentance is a change of thought. It's a change of direction. Well, in your mind, you say, yeah, I have that issue. I acknowledge that. I need help. And I want to do something about it. That's conviction. So Peter says, repent and be baptized. But he knew people were thinking, all right, I'm going to go out and make my life better. Like I did. That lasted, what, 15 minutes? And then Jesus said, and you shall receive the gift of what? The Holy Spirit. Because, see, you have a bent to sin. That doesn't go away when you're, after you're baptized, after your conversion. It's still there. That's why there's a battle. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
And the thing is, so that's a great point. As I'm looking at the clock here, the pastor said he's only anything over 11, I have to listen to the sermon in the foyer. So uh, anyway, I, I'm taking him at his word. So in essence, what God is saying, look, why do we need the Holy Spirit? And this is what gets into the law. We'll go a little further with that. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? And that gets to our fifth point that the moral guide and the standard of righteousness is for all criminals. The law gives us a standard of how to live after we've accepted Christ. Does that make sense? So let's see what comes first. If we're trying to live the Christian life and you don't know where you stand with God, you cannot live it. You agree? So what comes first? Being a child of God, accepting God's promise, not because we deserve it, because he wants to give it. He paid a lot to do that. Now, some people say, well, you know, I, uh, some of this stuff is cheap grace. You know what? You need to correct them. Grace is not cheap. Grace is expensive. And I know that's a play on words or a play on semantics. But I'll tell you this, is that I find it difficult to believe, and we can, and we'll get to that in a minute, that people who are contacted and in touch with God habitually continue to sin. I don't see it. I don't know how that can happen. That doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. I found out after my baptism that my, my certain traits of character and habits were still there. And they were still desirable in some cases. Okay? Jesus said you're still part of the family of God. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have what with God? Peace with God. Justified means God says, you're righteous whether you deserve it or not, but you don't. Okay, I, I wasn't necessarily pointing at you, Robert, uh, but uh, anyway. So this is what's important about the law. It used in its proper place. There was a Puritan back in the 16th century, I can't remember his name, he said this. The law points to the cross and the cross points back to the law and says, this is the regulator. How do you like that? Basically, it is the guide for us to learn to be more like him. And so as we walk through life, the moral law still stands, but different. How nice it is that we can say, I have the assurance of my salvation, because God said it's okay to have that assurance. But then Jesus tells us in John 15, probably one of the, I think the greatest text in the Bible is in the book of John, the 15th chapter, the branch and the vine. What does he tell us is our job as Christians? And then we're going to use one more text and probably wrap this up. What is our job as Christians according to John 15, the vine and the branch? Pardon? Stay connected. You don't see anywhere in there to keep the commandments. Now, um, and this is going to come together. It says, basically, stay connected. Now, how do we stay connected? You know, we talk all the time. Are we praying? Are we seeking God every day in prayer? That's how we stay connected, right? That's how we communicate with him. Are we spending time in the Word? Are we spending time in the Word? And I don't mean just looking at the Word, just kind of doing it in general. I mean studying the Word. You study the Word like you were teaching the Sabbath school. Because you want, by the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to what? Please God. You know what that means? I want you to think about that for a minute. To not accept God's promises for you is sin. Do you ever think about that? When God says that you're a child of God, he means it. And when you say, I'm not sure, what do you think that does to him? What do you think? Well, that, how is it when you basically have given a gift to someone and they give it back? They feel they got to repay you. You ever had that? I've done that on the other side. You feel like you owe them something, right? But when you really give a gift because you want to give it, you don't want it to be paid back, right? It's nice to give without expecting something in return from that perspective. Isn't that true? So, in essence, um, staying attached to the vine 
there is a major benefit. What is the major benefit that Jesus tells us by staying attached to the vine? You will produce what? Fruit. Now we said that the spirit of the law is based on what? Love, right? We've given some examples of that. Jesus said that you'll receive, not maybe, you could, but he said if you're attached to the vine, I want to tell you right now, you will produce fruit. He says so. I don't have to worry about producing fruit. I have to be concerned about staying connected, right? And so forth. So let me ask you this. What is the fruit of the Spirit? You realize that as we study our Bible and do exegesis on that chapter and on chapter 15, verse 5, there's only really one fruit of the Spirit, and that is love. Goodness, kindness, long-suffering is all descriptions of what love is all about. So Jesus is saying, if you want to have and live the spirit of the law, that where the Sabbath is really a denied, and not just something you have to do because he says so, but reaching out to others becomes a natural response. He said, you're going to need my love, not yours. And he said, I'm going to give that love to you if you stay connected. The problem with the Pharisees is they were not connected. They read their Bibles, but they were not connected, and they destroyed the one who they should have been connected with. Does that make sense? No wonder Paul, who looked at his life, he was killing Christians. I mean, he didn't forget that. And God pardoned him. He said, how can I not preach the gospel? When I, when I think of Paul, I think of one word, gospel. Did he hate the law? No. Did he try to teach Christians that the law is not in effect? No. But he put the law in its proper place. And that's what you and I need to do. Is to take the law, you're going to go through life, and say, what about if I sin? I had a boy on the list. I was teaching the juniors. And it was a good question, because I'd had that question. He said, well, Mr. Biggs, he said, what would happen if I had a terrible thought and I got killed in an automobile accident? I will tell you, some people say, well, you're probably lost. We're in and out of a righteousness and sin so often we don't know where we stand. And I, he was honest in his question. The Bible says, you know, in First John chapter 2, you know, it's better that you don't sin. I like that. That's how the NIV puts it in. It's better that you don't sin. But if you do sin, remember this. You have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous who will forgive you of all sin. So how does that work? Now I'm in Christ, I have the assurance of salvation. Do I run around saying, well, I guess I got it made? No, I don't. I have a battle of faith to deal with. My nature's trying to take that away. Yes, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's always the battle. But if we go through the Bible, we start to pick up some of these things and so forth. And the thing is, is that when we're living the life of sanctification, that's five minutes, right, Leo? Okay. He's always on me on that. He used to be anyway. Chuck, we got five minutes. Right in the most important part of the lesson, too. But uh, anyway, but it was appreciated. But uh, anyway, so you and I, what is this life of saying? I'm walking through life not willing about my salvation because God's promised it. But I also know that God wants me to be attached. He said so. Because I can't live in the spirit of the law without his love, which he will give if I'm attached. So what happens when I fall? I sometimes we fall willingly. Sometimes we fall by ignorance or whatever. What would he do? We go to the throne of grace. Sometimes when we sin, we don't go to the throne of grace because we hate to admit it, or we'd like to handle it, keep that sin for a while. Go to the throne of grace. Even if you desire it, go to the throne of grace. And when you go before God, you can say, you know, Lord, this issue I've got in my life. You're still in the church. You're still a Christian. You weren't thrown out the door because you just fell. 
Some people teach that. What does that do to us? It's, first of all, it's not biblical. And he says, come to the throne of grace. You say, you know what, I desired to do this. Can you take this away from me? What do you think his answer will be? But you've got to pursue it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because we must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we need to be diligent in our worship. We need to be diligent in our study. And I'm talking to myself. I can't speak for you, but it's good counsel. Okay, is that when we sin, we come to him, and what does he do? We see the law convicts us first. That's what it's supposed to do. It says, Chuck, uh-oh, this is not, you're not in step here. So it pushes me where? Just like it always says to the cross. You know, Colossians says, we are to walk we had to walk in Christ as we first came to him. It's the same process. And so I go to the cross. I thanked him. And, you know, uh, uh, there's a story about Mary Magdalene. When Jesus said to stop sinning, she didn't. For a while, she still held on. But ultimately, she stopped because of her love for Christ and his power in her life. That's what it can do. Right? So... The process continues to repeat. We fall, we go to the throne of grace. We're, okay, we're still in the family, but now the guilt complex of that particular sin, whatever it is, leaves us because God takes it. So that is the education on the law. Any questions or any points that you'd like to make that we may, may be left out? Isn't the law and grace a wonderful combination? Yes, it is. Let's bow our heads. Uh, Father, we do give thanks again for Jesus and for his love. We have nothing to say except we are sometimes, as Sister White has told us, that many times we'll come to the throne of grace ashamed of our conduct. And we've been there. And Lord, we give thanks for the positive things, the things where we have grown. And we, with shame, we bow our heads and think, Lord, help us with our difficulties in life. And as brethren in the church, let us help one another with our own difficulties. And so forth. let us pray for one another. We all want to be there with you. We have that assurance, but we need to be attached. We pray you'll help us with that, and we know you will, because it's in accordance with your will. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thanks so much. Appreciate your comments.